Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome. Welcome back. Um, hope you've had a good week being unlocked. So um, we'll just have a few minutes first just to uh, settle, just to relax and be present. And then we'll uh, get into this week's topic. So just uh, make yourself comfortable, just relax as best you can. Um, relax the body. Keep your back straight and the neck head slightly tilted forward. The arms resting in your lap. Right hand on top of the left, the thumb is touching. And just relax and observe the observe the breath coming and going. Just to settle the mind after getting here, being busy on the road, the car. So just relax and observe and enjoy breathing. Just observing the gentle flow of the breath coming in and going out. Just let any thoughts settle. We're just observing the breath, the rising and falling of the breath. Just feel the breath coming in, going out at your own pace, nothing else. Relaxing the body. and relaxing the mind. Feel the gentle flow of breath coming and going.
the mind rides on the breath. So just let the breath settle and the mind settle. So relax, be present. Let the thoughts come and go, just observe the breath. Gentle. The gentle rhythm of breathing, rising and falling, coming and going. and enjoy this opportunity to do nothing but breathe. Okay, just keep breathing. So our, um, this introductory series is 
based on Geshe Acharya Tugden Loden's book, The Essence of the Path to Enlightenment. We're up to chapter four, Refuge. Just a summary of last week. We looked at death. Death is definite. Time of death uncertain and only the practice of Dharma, one's good heart and mind, is of benefit at the time of death. So this week we are looking at refuge. So in Geshe's book, this is on page 55, and Geshe explains, we take refuge from a storm by finding a suitable shelter. In the same way, we take refuge from suffering of samsara by finding a suitable shelter. So generally, we take refuge in a storm, under an umbrella, or in a house, or in a shop, or out uh, bushwalking or somewhere, take refuge in a cave or a tent. If you're mm, um, escaping uh, unfortunate events, then you take refuge, if you're a refugee, you seek refuge in another country. For the, um, the Tibetans, when the communist invasion of Tibet happened in 1959, the Tibetans were offered refuge in India by President Nehru and in Nepal by the king as they escaped over the mountains. So refuge, you take refuge in the person, so the person offers refuge, and then you take refuge in the object that it is they're offering. So in this case, for the Tibetans, it was India. So they'd escaped from the communist invasion of Tibet, their own homeland, and sought refuge in India. So the same way if we look at refuge in the Buddha, Dharma and Sangha, the Buddha offers refuge and the Dharma is the refuge. And the Sangha is the spiritual community that supports that refuge. So generally, like for ourselves, we, Lama Yeshi used to say Western people take refuge in chocolate because when you freak out, you need something to um, somewhere to focus, somewhere to hide. So, and many people take refuge in mm, alcohol or drugs when things get too overwhelming um, as a way out. And fortunately with the, the Buddha, Dharma and Sangha, the refuge offered is an ultimate refuge. So it's not a temporary refuge. It's not a mm, yeah, temporary escape. It's an ultimate refuge that benefits benefits oneself and benefits others. So the um, the Buddha is the object of our refuge. And the Buddha's teachings, um, the entire 
spectrum of Buddha's teachings are referred to as the Dharma and they are the actual refuge and there's the internal and external Dharma and the external Dharma are the books so Geshe's um, Essence of the Path to Enlightenment and his other um, wonderful books, the Meditations on the Path and the Path to Enlightenment Big Book. These are the external refuge, the external Dharma, and the internal Dharma refuge is our own experience. So we need to to study, so to listen or read, and to think, to analyse the teachings, and then to meditate and apply the teachings. So the, the experience or the realisations that we have, that is the internal Dharma. And then with the, the Sangha, that's the spiritual community that provides support. So whether it's advice or like here at the Tibetan Buddhist Society, all the people who contribute to making these teachings available. So directly through being here present, assisting with making the um, this available or through looking after the temple or the property so all of these things are the the Sangha support and the the Arya Sangha are the beings who have realizations of the Dharma so who have the actual complete experiential aspect of the Dharma, so not just an intellectual um, an intellectual understanding, which is wonderful, but to really take it to heart and integrate it into one's, one's life. So we'll look through the um, This chapter on refuge, the um, so the analogy of Buddha Dharma Sangha too is that Buddha is like the doctor. So when you're suffering, which according to Buddhism, everybody in samsara, all beings, humans, animals, and all the other beings that we don't directly perceive that all beings are suffering, so to overcome that suffering you find someone who can mm, provide a remedy. So normally in um, our day-to-day -day suffering we can go to a doctor and explain where we're at. The doctor listens and they will prescribe some method of overcoming the sickness, whether it is physical, mental, psychological, whatever is required. So the, um, in this context, the Dharma is the medicine. So Lord Buddha's teachings are the medicine. So whether it's for in the worldly sense, a headache, um, whatever is necessary, or whether it's like at the present time with the COVID-19 worldwide epidemic, then the doctor, the medical profession provides the, the medicine. And then the, the Sangha, uh, the the nurses and all the other medical mm, assistants that support the doctor 
and the whole medical establishment working for our benefit. And the intention there is to make us well, so we get better, and then we're useful, for it's good for us, good for our family, our friends, it's um, useful. So in the Dharma context, that we, if we overcome our own suffering, then we can help others overcome theirs. And the experience of the overcoming the suffering is that all of Buddha's mm, teachings, so all of the chapters in, in Geshe's books are a step-by-step -step, um, method to overcome suffering. So basically we read the book or listen, we study and analyse the teachings, see if it actually is applicable, is useful, um, is functional, and then meditate on it. So we meditate on how, in this instance, taking refuge is a benefit. And so Geshe explains here that, uh, for instance, with meditation, so if we can meditate on single-pointed concentration, which is calm abiding, and the meditation on the breath can be a very useful object of single-pointed concentration, as can visualising Shakyamuni Buddha or any of the other Buddhas, and just day by day, week by week, month by month, year by year, practicing. Breathing is very useful because we do it moment by moment. But when taking the time to do the focusing single-pointedly, letting all the other thoughts just relax, just disappear, and bring the mind back constantly to the object. then we can overcome just through the mind settling, having a tranquil, calm, peaceful mind, overcome all the agitation, stress, worry, all the normal, normally accepted states of existence that people just put up with. So by practicing meditation and allowing the mind to just rest, then we can stop all the agitated states of mind and the stress and the worry. And as the Buddha says, Holiness has said, if something can be alleviated, if you can fix something, then do it. So you don't need to worry about it, you just do it. And if something cannot be fixed, then worrying doesn't fix it and is of no benefit, no use. So the wonderful thing about meditating and relaxing and placing the mind On, on an object of virtue is that agitation and stress and worry can be overcome. And all of the, the teachings in the Path to Enlightenment and all of the chapters as they're presented step by step, all are all aspects of the 
Bodhidharma medicine. So if we're looking at healing our mind, and in the Buddhist view of of um, beginningless lives and the continuum of our very subtle body, very subtle mind from life to life to life, beginningless and endless, and having no real experience or insight into what will come next as some um, Next week in the chapter is on karma. So karma is cause and effect. So we don't know what causes we've created and we don't know what effects will arise. In the same way that looking at the, the current um, pandemic, the epidemic across the whole planet is some amazing, unbelievable group karma that apart from a few scientists who do research in this area, nobody saw this coming. And no matter what money you have or where you live, it seems that COVID is in every country on the planet and in the the scheme of things the best medicine like the vaccines and things fantastic and will hopefully prevent um, death and sickness from COVID which is what all medicines are there for to actually heal us and make us feel better but the ultimate medicine is the Dharma. So it doesn't mean to say don't take the others. We need day to day good health of mind and body to exist. But the Dharma is our long term ultimate recovery from sickness so that we don't create the causes for sickness. and that we can see the nature of the way things are. So Buddhas perceive all objects of knowledge, which for us is overwhelming and beyond comprehension. But on the day-to-day -day level of things, if we just look at how refuge in Buddha Dharma Sangha can benefit us and benefit others, because there's nothing in the Buddhist refuge that is of harm. So it's good for us, it's good for others. It's Buddhism is about love and compassion and wisdom. So we're not harming others through our refuge. And the teachings of the, the Buddha, so the Dharma is all about attaining enlightenment for the benefit of all sentient beings. So it's a wonderful medicine for oneself and for others. And on the way through, we do whatever we need, take whatever medicines we need to keep ourselves healthy, fit, because we do exist as human beings. And we do get sick and we do experience suffering, headaches, various sicknesses. So the wonderful thing about medicine, whether it is Buddha, Dharma and Sangha, or whether it's just our, the medical system we have here, say in Australia, is that it is there to benefit. So the doctors, nurses are there to benefit us, to benefit them, to benefit sentient beings. So we take refuge for the benefit of all sentient beings. So we'll just look through the pages here of 
the chapter on refuge. So as Keshul says, the great spiritual disease is the disease of suffering. And as we get through the book, we'll find out the mm, causes and the, all the conditions of suffering. So suffering arises from karma and delusion. So karma is cause and effect, which is next week's subject. And delusion is our wrong view of the way things are, which is very deep, wonderful subject in the chapters in the book. And the reason the book is laid out in the order it is, is it is step by step, so it, to make, um, make it a bit easier as we go step by step, stage by stage. So as Kesha says, if we listen to the Buddha, if we take the medicine of practicing Dharma and rely on the support of the Sangha, we will definitely overcome the disease of suffering. So that's the idea. Overcome all of our stress, anxiety, worry, fears, fears of COVID, fears of any sickness, fears of ageing, death, fear of losing loved ones, fear of unemployment, fear of poverty. The human mind, there are so many states of suffering. So by practicing the Dharma, then we definitely overcome all of these stages. So that's the point. It's not um, practicing Buddhism. It's not just entertainment or something relaxing. It's very useful in this life, in all lives, and it benefits ourselves and it benefits others because the intention is to the intention is to attain enlightenment to benefit all sentient beings. So it's a very vast, wonderful, big scope intention to to help everyone. So rather than just friends or family, um, neighbours or our community or our country or even our planet or say just all human beings, it is the intention to benefit all numberless, countless, limitless sentient beings. And whether they are human beings or all the beings in the animal realms and their beings in the other realms. And it's not something that we can do immediately. Buddhas have been attained enlightenment, which can take many, many, many lifetimes. But since time is beginningless and endless, our lives are beginningless and endless then the intention, the it's a very good idea to practice Dharma, practice meditation, to overcome our own suffering, to actually attain enlightenment, because it is possible, and that everything in, in Dharma is taught as dependent arising. So it is all cause and effect. So if you create the causes, you do get the effects. So for us, for instance, if we, in this life, very simple basic things, if we eat good food, breathe healthy fresh air, get a reasonable amount of good exercise, then generally we are healthy. 
it's just basic cause and effect. In the same way that in Dharma they talk about how if you plant a seed of whatever um, fruit or vegetable, if you put in a some carrot seeds in your veggie patch and then give them the necessary conditions, put them in good soil, give them enough water in the right season, enough sunlight, look after them, then eventually you will get carrots. It's cause and effect. You won't get celery, you won't get rhubarb, all these other things. The seed results in the the same thing. So Dharma, we create the seed, we begin, we're really just beginners. But by practicing Dharma, by creating the just the continuous mm, connection with the Dharma, by meditating, by studying, by thinking. It's useful moment by moment. It's like the breathing meditation we did at the beginning. If we settle our mind and focus the mind, then we can be relaxed and clean, clear, see things as they are. So in the same way, the idea of refuge that we're looking at is refuge in the Buddha because the Buddha has attained enlightenment and said, this is the Dharma, check it out. If it works, then fantastic, use it. If it doesn't work for you, no problem. So if we check out, look at the Dharma, study the text, and really check them out. Is it valid? It's very important to to have some real appreciation of what you're doing rather than just I'll do it because it seems to be what everyone else is doing or it, mm, it's there, the Dharma is there to overcome our suffering, the suffering of our mind, our agitated, deluded states of mind, our boredom, our stress, our anxieties. So all of those things can all be overcome. They are just states of mind. They aren't the mind itself. The mind is, is likened to, say, the sky. Beautiful, clean, clear, blue sky. And the states of stress and worry and anxiety and fear and all these negative states are like smog or dust or clouds that fill the sky. But if we let all that settle, then the mind, the sky itself, is clean and clear. So that's what we're aiming to do, is to see that the clarity, the nature of the mind itself. So the meditations, we do these meditations step by step, a little bit at a time, to just be learn to actually perceive how the mind can be settled. So we don't need to struggle with the mind. Don't need to force or push. The mind itself is always clean, clear. In one of Kesha's wonderful books, The Fundamental Potential for Enlightenment, talks about the natural potential and the developed potential for enlightenment. That all beings have the potential for enlightenment because they all have mind. All sentient beings have consciousness. So what we're aiming to do 
is to see the true nature of our mind. And then develop that into thinking of all sentient beings and benefiting all sentient beings without without any exceptions. So nobody, no one left out. So we go, go beyond the the worldly samsaric views of friends, enemies and strangers, and we just contemplate all sentient beings as equal. So all these wonderful teachings in the Dharma of the beginninglessness of lives and how all ten beings have been our mother in one or more or many of those lives. That time is beginningless, endless. So we've been very, very close to every sentient being, even those that we now dislike with great intensity or or don't care about. That through cause and effect, the change, the impermanence of things, that everything changes. And we have such a small and narrow view of things that we only see those around us. So we need to expand our, our mind and to think of all, all numberless, limitless sentient beings. So it's just expanding the mind, it's just thinking big. And it doesn't require us to go anywhere else or to be a yogi or a yogini or live in a cave or a forest or somewhere. So we're just we keep it simple, Keshila taught it like that here in the West, here, where we work or we go to university or school or retired or whatever, but we can fit all the, the practice of Dharma into our daily existence. So it's nowhere we, special we have to be. We just practice where we are whether we're at home or whether we're at the shops or in traffic or at work or at uni or at the beach, anywhere. It's just the mind that we are working with, working on in our Dharma practice. So we're just observing mind and allowing all the, all the negative and crazy states of mind to settle or just in meditation observing them and watching them pass because we can watch the stream the continuum of states of mind thoughts just keep coming we can't hold on to the thought whether it's worry or fear it will pass and another one will come you will worry about something else. So practicing the, the meditations and we can, when we get further down the, through the book, we can look at um, meditations, the ones that you feel best suited for you. But this stage we'll just look at the breathing meditation. So the idea is that the breathing meditation is just there to settle our mind when we get agitated. So it's really useful here when we just come to class, having just come out of the traffic and the, the speed of the roads and whatever, the busyness of life. So we come and sit down, settle the mind and just contemplate the Dharma. And if you read and memorize the, the texts, just understanding the, the basic outlines. So when you 
you're totally freaking out about something and rather than taking refuge in television or opening the fridge to find something to settle the mind, just to settle down and breathe, just let the mind settle. So nothing in our practice is really um, difficult or too challenging. We're not... Um, it's all doable, it's all workable, and that's the point of it all, where we keep it... We keep it doable so that we know we can achieve this. So Geshele here says... The Buddha is the principal object of refuge and his attainment, and there are many female Buddhas too. So, Buddhas are the principal object of refuge and their attainment, that of enlightenment, is the goal of our practice. We should therefore know something of the qualities of a Buddha. When we speak of the Buddha, Generally, we think of historical Buddha. So normally, when, when we talk of the Buddha, we're talking about Shakyamuni Buddha here, behind me. And these teachings do come directly from Shakyamuni Buddha, who was in India 2,600 years ago. And he was a prince, and he renounced his royal life, just showing being a royal isn't everything, and that that too will pass. And he went looking for enlightenment with the intention of benefiting all living beings. So as Geshe said, Shakyamuni Buddha, however, is not the only Buddha. Many of his followers have also attained a state of enlightenment and have thus become Buddhas. So that's the intention, that's what we're slowly, slowly, step by step, that's what we're doing. We're just beginners, but we, the intention is to actually attain enlightenment. And it is, it is all possible. It may take a long time, but as I said, the, our lifetimes are endless, so we do have a bit of time. And... If we don't practice Dharma, then we just continue to go around and around in uncertainty, uncharted, the effects of causes we don't know we've created. So if we're creating now the causes of wishing to attain enlightenment, then, and creating the, the conditions then what we're doing here is like, it's like the garden of practicing Dharma. So we're creating the seeds, we then nurture our practice in the right conditions, with the right um, Sangha and the community. And in due course, then we attain enlightenment. And not for ourselves, but for all sentient beings. So the special said, what exactly is a Buddha then? Good way to understand a Buddha and his or her state of enlightenment is that a Buddha is a being free from the two obscurations. And these are the obscuration to liberation and the obscurations to omniscience. So the obscurations to liberation are karma and delusion. So karma, the causes and effects of just continuing to create unsatisfactory outcomes. And the delusions of thinking that by doing these things these ways, we will get a better outcome and the gross habit of ignorance. So ignorance is not perceiving things the way they are. And generally, it's a, quite a deep topic. And, uh, 
it has its own chapter in there on wisdom. But the generally we perceive things, all of us, as inherently existing which aren't existing from their side. So we think that the object is that object. So when we see a um, a car, we just see it as a car. But it has and we don't see the, the fact in that moment of seeing a car. It has causes and conditions. So somebody had to actually design all the cars. And then it has to be have all the parts and it has to actually function. And then it's imputed as a car by us as human beings. Like for dogs or cats or uh, ants, they probably don't go around saying, look at the car. And if you went back two or three centuries and showed someone one, a vehicle of some sort from today, they wouldn't automatically say, oh, that's a car. So everything is like that. It's things are dependent on causes and conditions. And that's the basic thing. So everything has causes, everything has conditions, and then everything has parts. And when we think of ourselves, we do the same thing. So we just think, I am this, I am this body. But our body is completely made up of parts. And it's causes and conditions from our parents. And their parents, and theirs and theirs and theirs. And then all these causes and conditions needed to keep our body alive. Our body is dependent on air and food and warmth and shelter. So there's so many conditions that actually make up our body. So every single thing is like this. All, every object that we perceive that we just think is that is that is actually dependent and is, it is impermanent. So in the this habit, gross habit of ignorance is the view that things exist from their own side. So Geshe says, being free of these, the obscurations to liberation, so the karma delusion, the habit of ignorance, a Buddha is no longer bound by positive or negative karma. Because they see things as they are. Buddhas are free of all delusions and the gross habit of the ignorance grasping at inherent existence. So it's this grasping for things that don't have that. They don't innately possess the qualities that we think they do. The obscurations to omniscience are the subtle habits of ignorance and the appearance of inherent existence with regard to the objects of the six consciousnesses. So this is so further exploration, exploration down the track. So the six consciousnesses are eye, ear, nose, tongue, body, and mental consciousness. So each of our body senses, eyes, ears, nose, tongue, body and mental consciousness are the six consciousnesses. Being free of these, a Buddha has no impediment to knowing because 
he or she is not in any way deluded or tainted. The Buddha's mind has inconceivable qualities and knowledge. So it's like um, Buddhas, their mind is vast. We just use our mind basically day to day to think of things, worry about things, attempt to create the conditions to attain what we want. Whereas Buddha's minds are just vast and inconceivable. And they are observing and considering all sentient beings. Any being then who frees their mind of the two obscurations, the obscurations to liberation and the obscuration to knowing, is a Buddha. So that's all we have to do is attain to overcome the obscurations to liberation and the obscurations to omniscience. That person has become enlightened. And in doing so, they achieve two great aims. The aim of perfect benefit to oneself and the aim of perfect benefit to others. So Geshe also explains why Mm, taking refuge with confidence. So basically, there are four reasons why a Buddha is worthy of being an object of refuge and can be relied upon completely. The Buddha is free of all fear. So Buddha's fear is a state of mind of a samsara. An ordinary being. So Buddha has attained complete tranquility and a state of fearless, fearlessness. If he were not beyond the suffering of cyclic existence, Buddha would not be able to help others escape. The Buddha has realized the path of cessation and has the cessation of suffering. Buddha has the perfection of all qualities and all encompassing knowledge and therefore has unimpeded capability to benefit others. And the Buddha has also free of all fears for himself or herself because they have eliminated the source of such fears which is self-cherishing and self-grasping. And the Buddha has skillful means to free others from fear because the, the teachings, the Dharma, pacifies Buddha is able to deal precisely with the problems faced by all types of beings because Buddhas have removed the obscurations to omniscience. Thus, Buddhas have no impediment to knowing the minds and capabilities of living beings and can act spontaneously and naturally to respond appropriately to the needs of living beings. So that's where in practicing or living the path to enlightenment, we create the connection to Buddhas, to the Dharma. So we already have a connection in that we, we are here. So that's, we have a connection. The, and in this time, it's said that the 
Buddhas appear, so all of like Geshe Acharya to Tindlod and all the other Lamas, His Holiness, Dalai Lama, are all Buddhas manifesting in human form because at a higher, mm, deeper state of meditation, it is said that we can actually perceive Buddhas in our meditation. So we don't have those abilities. We are like, mm. like our animals, the pets that we have, that are, have wonderful conditions and we look after them and they live in the same house as us, but they don't have the same abilities as we have. So cats and dogs rely on us to to go shopping for them and to feed them and to um, yeah so that they're they're very close to us they're no longer living in the wild and having to hunt for food or whatever but they don't they're not able to maybe some not able to turn on the lights or the heaters or uh, open a tin or a packet of dog or cat food um, so the same way like for us as human beings we need to create the connection to Buddhas so that more and more like in our meditations we come closer to the Buddhas because the Buddhas are there to assist at all time so it's said that like from our side we just don't perceive them so that's why in in doing in generating meditation practice with pure good motivation so not just grasping to see Buddhas but with a meditation with the thought of meditating to benefit all sentient beings to so wishing to attain enlightenment for the benefit of all sentient beings and come closer and closer to understanding Buddhas and perceiving Buddhas then we are clearing the obscurations and delusions of our mind that's what we're doing step by step so that it all actually makes sense and is workable and functional as we as we follow the path to enlightenment so one of the other qualities of Buddhas, taking refuge in Buddhas, is that they have great compassion and love for all without discrimination. So the Buddha helps all sentient beings equally, never favouring one over another. So in contrast, ordinary people, that's us, discriminate between those regarded as friends, enemies, or strangers. And the Buddha, the fourth quality, the Buddha benefits all sentient beings, whether they have helped Buddhas or not. So the Buddha helps any living being, regardless of whether they have helped a Buddha. By contrast, most ordinary people only look after those they hold dear, the ones who have helped them in some way or may do so in future. So while Guru Shakyamuni Buddha was around, he helped all beings equally and never considered himself to be too high to help others, no matter how unpleasant their condition or how low their caste. He personally healed the sick and taught the Dharma to all, whether they were of high or low caste, kings or householders. So taking refuge in the Triple Gem, Buddha Dharma Sangha, lifts your mind 
from its ordinary perspective to a far greater perspective. By taking refuge in the Buddha, you allow your mind to embrace the qualities of enlightenment expressed in the various forms of the Buddha. So basically we are following the practices, the methods that all the Buddhas have followed and they've become Buddhas. So the, the six perfections of, which we'll get to more and more explanation, generosity, uh, ethics, patience, joyous effort, or sometimes called perseverance, uh, concentration, which is the meditation, settling the mind and focusing, so whether it is the breath or any other object that we're contemplating. And the sixth perfection is wisdom, which is seeing the actual the actual nature of things. That all things are dependent arisings. So everything we are experiencing mentally or physically is a dependent arising. And therefore is not existing from its own side. So the, the, um, the wisdom aspect of that, which is applicable in meditation, is to look at how things do not exist from their own side. They're not a permanent existing thing. They are dependent. So just to uh, complete this chapter, Geshe says, By taking refuge in the Dharma, you place your confidence in the philosophy and practices of the Dharma as reliable ways to view and respond to the events of life. So that's basically making it a functional practice on a day-to-day -day level. There's no time when Dharma is not applicable. For example, you rely on deep concentration and tranquility to guard your state of mind. You rely on wisdom and insight into the nature of phenomena to open your perspective. You rely on the Dharma teachings of compassion, love, joy and equanimity to guide your relationship with others. By taking refuge in the Sangha, you rely on like-minded people whose perspective is uplifted by the practice of Dharma. Taking refuge or placing your reliance on the Buddha, Dharma and Sangha has great benefits. It immediately empowers you with the accumulation of merit, so positive energy. Your mind becomes joyful, secure with a sense of being protected by the Buddha, Dharma and Sangha. Your meditation improves and you are thus able to purify your mind of the delusions of attachment, anger, jealousy and so on. You have a sense of being protected by and guided by the three jewels and consequently do not come under the influence of harmful and destructive beings. 
instead of being propelled by your attachment, anger, ego, jealousy and so on, you are guided by the wisdom, compassion and love expressed in Buddha Dharma Sangha. So we'll do a few more minutes of um, bringing the, the mind back to the breath and just um, just observing the breath. and letting the mind settle. Just letting the mind seeking shelter, refuge in the Buddha Dharma Sangha. Just let your breathing rise and fall. Just think of the Buddha Dharma and Sangha as a wonderful place of shelter around you, protecting you from the storm of samsara. Just allowing your mind be completely relaxed, naturally. And just feel the blessings, the energy of the Buddha's mind at your heart and radiating out. Love and compassion for all limitless living beings. Just let the mind be at peace, be at peace with itself. Relaxed. and very clean and clear. And just think with the blessings of the Buddhas, the mind is able 
to handle whatever conditions arise. Calmly, evenly, clearly. And then to conclude, we'll just do a simple dedication prayer to dedicate the, the merit, the virtue, the good intention of this, our practice, so that it is of benefit to all beings who are beyond number, beyond our current limited comprehension, but thinking be expanding our mind of love and compassion. I think by this virtue may all beings complete collections of wisdom and merit and attain the two holy bodies risen from wisdom and merit. May the precious superior mind of enlightenment be generated in those who have not yet generated it and not decrease in those who have developed it but increase continuously Okay, thank you. Does anybody have any questions? It's a beautiful sunny day. Welcome. Do we have any questions online? Are we on delay? We have a time delay. The rest of the world is one minute behind us. The emptiness of time. Is that possible? Now, the wonderful thing about Dharma practice is that it is useful and applicable anywhere, anytime, and don't need any special equipment or anything. It's just the mind. So whether it's automatically practicing love and compassion or just settling the mind when there's mm, conditions of freak out or something, stress or fear, then creating the ability to just settle the mind and not follow trains of thought of worry or anxiety of these things. Yeah. No question. 
All right, thank you very much for coming. Um, we've got tea and coffee and things out here, I believe. Yeah. Do we have tea? If people are online, they have to go and make their own. Um, <laughs> thank you. Um, yeah, so just out here, tea and coffee and cakes. Or also, we have the enjoyment shop open. A vast selection of goodies that Janine will proudly show you through. Yeah, it's a shop where you buy enjoyment. Thank you all for coming. Have a relaxed, wonderful week ahead. Meet back soon here and coming after the big conference.